The Geiger-Marsden, or Gold Leaf Experiment, was arguably the experiment that began nuclear physics. It revolutionized our understanding of the structure of the atom, and proved that there was, in fact, some dense bit of matter sitting there right in the middle of the atom, which we now call the nucleus. But how did this experiment come to be? Well, it all starts with the physicist Ernst Rutherford. Rutherford was interested in alpha particles, which he had discovered in 1899, and he wanted to measure their mass-to-charge ratio. Now, alpha particles are one of three types of radiation emitted by radioactive substances, as we'll see in a later video. And nowadays, we know that they're made of two protons and two neutrons. But Rutherford didn't know that, so to him it was just some positively charged particle that you got by removing the electrons from a helium atom. So, in order to conduct his experiment, he needed a way of counting the number of alpha particles emitted by some radioactive substance, in this case radon. So, him and German physicist Hans Geiger invented a device, now called the Geiger counter, that would do just that. And the Geiger counter is basically just a tube filled with air, in which there is a positively charged bit, called an anode, and a negatively charged bit, called a cathode. Now, it was known that alpha particles are ionizing, so if you fling one into the air, it will ionize some air molecules, and the positive ion will be attracted to the cathode, while the electron will be attracted to the anode. Now, this essentially generates an electric current, which can be picked up by a detector, and this current will essentially indicate the number of alpha particles that are being emitted from some radioactive substance. But there was just one problem. Rutherford assumed that the alpha particles would go right through, but they were in fact being deflected quite strongly, such that their paths were quite erratic, and so the numbers of ions produced could not be relied on to calculate the number of alpha particles emitted. Now this surprised Rutherford because he didn't think alpha particles could be deflected so strongly. So naturally he set up an experiment to test how alpha particles are deflected by matter. And for this he enlisted Hans Geiger, as well as one of Geiger's undergraduate students, Ernst Marsden. So together they set up an experiment which essentially involved bombarding a piece of gold foil with these alpha particles, and then detecting their final positions using a fluorescent screen. Now according to the conventional wisdom of the day, the alpha particles should have just gone right through, and this is because the prevailing model of the atom was the plum pudding model, put forward by J.J. Thomson, the discoverer of the electron. Thomson believed that the atom was essentially a positively charged lump in which were placed some negatively charged electrons, such that the positive and negative charges balance out. And this kind of resembled the plum pudding, an English dessert that was dotted with raisins, or plums as they were called. Now according to this model, the charges are all diffusely distributed around the atom, and since there is no big concentration of charge, there is nothing to deflect the alpha particles and they would go right through. Now that is what happened most of the time, but some of the time, the alpha particles were deflected by some pretty large angles. And in some very rare instances, and we're talking 1 in 8,000 times, the particles would be deflected backwards, in other words, by more than 90 degrees. Now, this was quite astonishing. In Rutherford's own words, it was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. Now these strange results did force Rutherford into some pretty revolutionary conclusions. Uh, so first, the fact that the alpha particles were deflected by some large angles meant that there must be some concentration of positive charge in the atom, called the nucleus. If the positive charge were distributed uniformly, as in the plum pudding model, you wouldn't get the concentration of charge necessary to deflect the particles by such large angles. At the same time, this only happened with a few particles. Most of them just went through undeflected. So Rutherford concluded that most of the atom must be empty space. So the atom is composed of a nucleus surrounded by a lot of empty space. And Rutherford could now guess that this nucleus must be very, very small. This is because there were very few instances where the alpha particles were deflected back, and this is what you would expect from a full head-on collision with the nucleus. So from this, he calculated that the nucleus must be about one ten thousandth the size of the atom in radius. 
So, if the nucleus was a tennis ball, the whole atom would be as wide as seven Empire State buildings stacked on top of each other. So you can imagine that Geiger and Marsden must have waited a really long time to see those back deflections. So in any case, because of the geiger marsden experiments, our whole conception of the structure of the atom was overturned in favor of a model actually originally proposed before these experiments by Japanese physicist Hantaro Nagaoka. He conceived of a sort of solar system model of the atom, with a positively charged nucleus at the center and electrons orbiting around it, bound by electrostatic forces. Now this raised some interesting challenges, including the fact that it was impossible to have this structure within the confines of classical physics, because classical physics predicted that the electrons would very quickly spiral into the nucleus. And this motivated people like Niels Bohr to create a quantum mechanical model of the atom. In this model, the electrons can occupy a discrete set of energy levels only, and absorbing some electromagnetic radiation will promote an electron to a higher energy level, and the electron can also spontaneously emit electromagnetic radiation and drop down to a lower energy level. So it is for this reason that the model is sometimes referred to as the Bohr-Rutherford model of the atom, because Bohr provided some of the theoretical explanation for how this model is possible in the first place. <laughs>